Welcome, everyone. I'm Claude Mayers, and we have a terrific and very informative show today. Don't let the genetically engineered gene out of the bottle. We'll have Jeffrey Smith with us. Hi, Jeffrey. Hi, Claude. Great to be How here. How are you today? Excellent. Excellent. Looking forward. I'm so happy to have you here. It's been an honor to have you. Jeffrey is the leading spokesperson on the dangers of genetically engineered foods. He's an award-winning filmmaker. He's the author of several books about genetic roulette, seeds of deception, and he has traveled the world and visited at least 45 countries and built a global movement alerting consumers to the dangers of their foods. And he, currently, he's informing us about what he calls GMO 2.0, about the next generation of genetic engineering. So can you tell us a little bit about that, Jeffrey? Well, sure. Um, for 26 years, I've been educating people about the health dangers of eating GMOs. And uh, fortunately, <clears throat> most people got it. Most people in the United States realize that GMO foods are not safe. Uh, about half the world's population, and that sort of kept it at check. But most people have heard of CRISPR and other gene editing techniques that make creating GMOs much more accessible, really cheap. So cheap, in fact, you can buy a do-it-yourself kit online for $169 and create new GMO bacteria. We're concerned that this new access to gene editing technology carries with it unprecedented threats, threats that actually um, would be considered existential. And, and in the film, Don't Let the Gene Out of the Bottle, we talk about the genetic engineering or gene editing of microbes that could create cataclysms. And so we'll talk, Claude, about the impact of the new generation of GMOs and also what, the, what we know about the old generation. What about eating soy and corn and cottonseed oil and canola oil and sugar from sugar beets and alfalfa and potatoes and apples and papaya and squash that have been genetically engineered. Why is it important to avoid that? And then we'll also talk about most GMOs are sprayed with Roundup herbicide, which is extremely dangerous. And but it doesn't stop there. Roundup is also sprayed on many other non-GMO crops. So you have to know how to avoid that, and we'll talk about organic, et cetera. So this is going to be a journey not only into healthier eating, but also how this generation could lock down a technology where if we don't, it could threaten the survival and health of humans and nature in future generations. And there's hope, in other words, oh, yeah. also, because... You can, if you switch a diet to organic, tell us a little story about that. You, uh, sure. Uh, I see some of your works where you did. So in 2012, I started asking audiences, what did you notice when you switched to non-GMO, largely non-GMO or organic? I'd been speaking since 1996. There was a sizable contingent of people in the audiences I was, I was speaking to around the world. And I decided to just get a sense of what people noticed. And people would raise, I'd raise their hand if they noticed an improvement. I'd call on them and people would say, okay, uh, acid reflux or Crohn's disease or, or insomnia or gluten sensitivity or whatever. And I'd say, okay, how many others notice something like this, a digestive problem, a allergic problem, a skin condition, cardiovascular, hypertension, who lost weight? How many people are increasing energy now or reducing brain fog? And in about 150 lectures, I got a pretty clear profile of what was going on. And some of those lectures, like about two dozen of them, were medical conferences where the audience was not talking about their own reaction as much as their audience, their patient's reaction. So they had up to a thousand different patients, in some cases, thousands of patients that they had put onto non-GMO or organic diets, and they were describing their benefits. And so... I wrote down the 28 different conditions that I remembered people saying they got better from and then surveyed 3,256 people 
And they reported getting better, not only from the same 28 conditions, but in the same relative frequency. The number one condition that people got better from consistently at all the lectures was digestive disorders. And of the 3,256 people, 85.2% said they got better from digestive disorders. The next thing I'd ask at the audiences, for the audience was how many people increased energy and reduced brain fog? We broke it out. 60% said uh, increased energy uh, and the brain fog about 52% said less. And there was also uh, overweight and obesity, mood problems like anxiety and depression, food allergies and sensitivities. And we're still above 50% of the respondents. And it includes autism and asthma and menstrual problems and, and musculoskeletal pain and autoimmune disease, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, cancer. Now, this is just what people are reporting getting better from. And if it was that alone, it would be fairly, it would be interesting. Certainly it's interesting because many of it is in clinical experience. Doctors tell us that their patients get better from these things. But we have additional data. The average American eats more than their weight in GMOs. So if GMOs are really a problem, it should actually have been accompanied by, as it was introduced in the late 90s, an increase of certain diseases. And if it's really related to either the GMOs or the Roundup sprayed on them, then the rise would be parallel or at least close. You could track the correlation. Doesn't prove causation, but it's interesting data. And sure enough, over 35 diseases, many of the ones we just mentioned, rose in parallel with the increased use of GMOs and Roundup in the food supply. Sometimes it's almost an exact line of the slope, like autism and the use of Roundup on GMO soy and corn. But, and there's all sorts of cancers related. Now we have the correlational data, the, the epidemiological data. We have personal and clinical results, but we also have animal feeding studies that show that when you feed animals these GMOs or the Roundup uh, sprayed on them, they suffer from these type of diseases or their precursors. We also talked to veterinarians who treat animals before GMOs were introduced and then after, and they saw an uptick of all these type of diseases. They put the animals on a healthier diet and the problems go away or get, sol get solved to the point where it was the general population before GMOs were introduced into the pet food or into the animal feed. Now we understand modes of action. So, for example, if you're having trouble sleeping and you switch to an organic diet, which doesn't allow GMOs or Roundup herbicide, and your sleeping gets better, we can say, guess what? Roundup and its active ingredient called glyphosate blocks the production of a aromatic of, of an amino acid that's used to create melatonin, which helps you go to sleep. So if you don't have enough melatonin, forget about it. Same thing with serotonin. If you're depressed or if you have cognitive problems that go away when you switch to organic food, it could be the serotonin. If you have more energy, less brain fog, it could be the fact that Roundup damages the energy centers of our cell, the mitochondria. You can see that in a test tube. So when you take that out of the diet, all of a sudden it's like you have more energy. Pet owners say their dogs are acting like puppies now because they were just moping around all the time. I talked to a farmer. He said his young pigs were just exhausted all the time. Put them on a non-GMO diet and they act like piglets. And it's a dramatic change. It's not just, you know, when I first started hearing from people as I was traveling around the world that they could tell the difference whether they eat GMOs or not. I'm a little bit ashamed to say, or embarrassed anyway, that I didn't believe them. Now I hear it all the time. And so I suggest that when people switch to organic, you take notes. Take notes not only to energy level and mood, but every single symptom you're suffering from, one to 10. Down that spreadsheet on the top, the percentage of organic diet, percentage of food that's organic in your diet that day. And watch what happens not because you may be looking for losing weight, but your skin conditions clear up or your brain fog goes away or your hormone systems are now back online. 
because all of them are related and we actually know the modes of action why. We can tell you based on the studies why it is very likely that the GMOs and Roundup in your food supply are linked to those particular disorders and diseases. Why don't we define organic and what it's not? So organic is defined actually by what it's not. It's defined by what uh, prohibited practices. So you're not allowed to use GMOs, genetically modified organisms, where the DNA has been changed artificially in a laboratory in new ways. You're not allowed to use sewage sludge. You're not allowed to use radiation. You're also not allowed to use a whole long list of toxic chemicals, including Roundup and its active ingredient or its chief, act, chief poison, glyphosate. Now, if you're trying to avoid GMOs, you can go to the non-GMO project verified um, seal, which is, I think, an excellent third-party verification. But you may get a, this is a non-GMO loaf of bread, or this is non-GMO package of oatmeal. But we now know that they spray Roundup on wheat and oats just before harvest to dry down the product, to speed up the ripening, and now, what percent? What percent? What percent? What percent of wheat, for example, do you believe is sprayed with Roundup? You say about a week before harvest, so that it's, it's all kind the, of uniform in ripeness. You know, I've heard different answers to that. Um, um, some say virtually all of it. Um, some say it's particularly the spring wheat or the hard. What happens is this: um, in the northern climates, when you're growing wheat in Canada and northern parts of the, of the plains, you're getting close to bad weather and you want to make sure that you can harvest at the right time. So if you spray glyphosate-based herbicides, the plant's going to die. And when the plant's going to die, it says, send energy to the kids for the next generation. So it sends all this energy and the glyphosate into the, into the grains, which are like the seeds. And so it, it speeds up the ripening. And so there's an advantage to the farmer. At the same time, they've just killed all the weeds. And so it's ready for next year's planting. At the same time, it dries down the grain, desiccates it, so there's less chance of mold. So it's like a three big wins for the farmer. Um, and you get to, to harvest before the bad weather. But I've been told by some that it's really a uniform practice or it's used very, very often. And wheat and other grains are mixed together in grain elevators and shipped together. So you may have one uh, farm that doesn't do it and one farm that does. So that when you look at, if you go to responsibletechnology.org, which is our nonprofit website, you can look at the list of foods and the glyphosate residue levels and wheat is right up there. Even higher is oats. Neither wheat nor oats are genetically engineered, but they're sprayed just before harvest. And according to Monsanto, which is now Bear, Bear bought Monsanto, according to their instructions, three to five days before harvest. So right before it's put into your food supply, it's sprayed with a poison. And it does not have to be labeled. So the oh, consumer doesn't know that. You, you won't pick up um, food products in the United States and list all the different uh, synthetic chemicals that were used to spray it. Sometimes you'll read a study and be shocked to find out that most of the fruits and vegetables have some residue levels. So one of the advantages of organic, not only does it avoid GMOs and at least one chemical, which I know about a great deal, and it's been in the news a lot since it's the most popular, the most widely used agricultural chemical in history, and it is now considered a class 2A carcinogen, and it's linked to all sorts of diseases. But there are other chemicals like atrazine and other things, some of which are banned already in Europe, but still allowed in your breakfast cereal. So going to organic is a very important first step to live a healthy life. And there are other things that are, um, are ruled out that, that cannot be organic. Uh, waste from animals fed to animals or diseased meat from animals and sewage treated plants are also non-organic. 
you are allowed to use certain um, manure for composting, um, and there are specific restrictions there. Um, but some of the manure has glyphosate levels in it, so it's um, it's a tricky situation because some of it, in the chicken, chicken manure, you know, it has some high levels of glyphosate. So if you have your own garden and you're going to be using compost, look for organic. Uh, fed animals for the for the manure. Look for organic compost, etc. Organic uh, everything. We're speaking with Jeffrey Smith, especially about genetically engineered food and microbes. We're going to talk about microbes a little bit. Um, why don't we talk about the whole idea, though, of taking a chemical that will kill weeds, making a seed that goes with that chemical and is genetically engineered not to die from the chemical while all the weeds around it will. Sure. You talked about that a little bit and the, so, and the companies that do that. Monsanto had the patent on Roundup herbicide. And Roundup contains glyphosate, and glyphosate was originally patented as a descaler to clean the mineral buildup off of the pipes and boilers in factories and because it grabs onto minerals it's a chelator and then it pulls it off and when they took the residue of that and spread it into fields it killed all of the plant life so Monsanto bought the chemical and patented it as an herbicide now they are the, their patent was running out in the year 2000 so genetic engineering was available where you could take genes with their particular traits from one species and insert them, often violently with a gene gun, into the DNA of other species. And someone was noted, and glyphosate is an antibiotic, it kills tons of bacteria, particularly the beneficial bacteria. But in a chemical waste dump near a factory for glyphosate, there was bacteria surviving. So they took a gene out of that bacterium that allowed it to survive, and they put it into soybeans and corn and canola and cotton and sugar beets and alfalfa, genes from bacteria that allow those crops to survive when sprayed with Roundup or any glyphosate-based herbicides. Now, when their patent expired in year 2000, they were already selling Roundup Ready crops throughout the Midwest and in some other countries where weeding all of a sudden became super easy. You can't spray a field with a herbicide while the crop is up there because you'll kill the crop. So you can spot spray, you can cultivate with a hoe, you can spray beforehand. But with the Roundup Ready crops, you can spray on the crops themselves by tractor, even by airplane. It'll kill all of the other plant biodiversity, which they call weeds, and leave the crop untouched. Well, not entirely untouched, Claude, because glyphosate is connected to a, another chemical, POEA, that drives it into the tissues of the plant. So it actually enters the soybean plant most of it gets moved into the soybean itself. And now we have soybeans from some Roundup Ready crops. The crop didn't die, but you may if you eat the soybean. Now, you're not going to die like that if you eat a, a Roundup Ready soybean. But there's a lot of things about that soybean you do, really don't want in your system. And one of them is the glyphosate that's a class 2A carcinogen. And 125,000 people who were spraying Roundup for their gardens or farms, are plaintiffs in class action lawsuits against Bayer, which bought Monsanto, and they've had to pay billions of dollars because the World Health Organization says, yes, it does cause cancer in animals and probably causes cancer in humans, but that we don't have any studies that directly prove it. So it's a probable human carcinogen because it does what it cancer causing agents do. It messes up the structure of our DNA it causes cancer in animals, and where it's used in high concentrations, cancer rates go up. So we're calling you glyphosate know, a class 2A carcinogen. We're speaking to Jeffrey Smith here. So in other words, 
the seeds, the plants, they absorb the glyphosate. So you are eating plants and food with glyphosate poison, which is known to cause Hodgkin, non-Hodgkin's uh, sarcoma, I think is it? Lymphoma. Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. lymphoma. But you see, right. there's a correlation between a number of types of cancer. And if you look at those cancer, liver, kidneys, gallbladder, um, uh, leukemia, it's where the glyphosate ends up in the animal studies when they give the animal glyphosate. It goes there, and that's what ends up getting cancer. So there's a reason why it's actually linked to more than just non-Hodgkin lymphoma. The strongest evidence is there, so that's why the plaintiffs were about non-Hodgkin lymphoma. But there's evidence about leukemia and all these others. And that's just some of the diseases, as we've talked about before. So where's the status of the patent at this point? How are these companies? Now it's Bayer that owns Monsanto. Is that correct? That's right. So how are they making money if the patent expired? This is a great question. I was getting there and I didn't say it yet. When the farmers buy the Roundup Ready seeds to plant their crops, they sign paperwork which says they will only buy that company's Bayer Monsanto's Roundup or, or glyphosate-based herbicides. China, China produces a lot of glyphosate-based herbicides, but if you buy Roundup Ready soy, corn, cotton, canola, sugar beets, or alfalfa, You've signed a contract saying that you better not use another company's glyphosate-based herbicides or you'll get sued. And they've sued hundreds of farmers, threatened them. And there's films about how farmers have been mistreated at the hands of people who've sued them, even though they never actually used Roundup. The seeds got blown and you can't use their seeds also unless you buy them and buy them each year. You can't save your seeds and plant them the next year. So you can't, you can't save seeds and plant them the next year and you can't use another company's chemicals. And so they have all sorts of cops out there trying to find it and make a lot of mistakes and threaten people who have never violated laws or contracts, but whose lives are turned upside down by this bullying. Yeah, to show you how crazy the technology is, at one point they developed the Terminator technology where the seed would never reproduce so you had to buy new seed every year what and happened with that, that did that it wasn't ever that or it wasn't ever deployed because a bunch of country representatives raised the alarm and said this is terrible you see it was very explicit they didn't want to have to do the lawsuits they just wanted let me go back even further in 1999 in january uh, a representative of the now defunct anderson consulting who had worked with monsanto described how it approached Monsanto executives and asked them to describe what their ideal future was in 15 to 20 years. And the Monsanto executives described a world in which 100% of all commercial seeds in the world were genetically engineered and patented. And the consulting company worked backwards from that goal to create the strategy and tactics to achieve it. So they had to create a regulatory framework that didn't slow them down no testing necessary, no safety studies necessary, and they got that passed through the United States. There, the, the White House told the FDA, EPA, and USDA to promote GMOs, and so and the F FDA created a new position for Monsanto's attorney, Michael Taylor, who said, we don't see any difference between GMOs and non-GMOs, therefore no testing is needed. You don't even have to tell the FDA, you can just introduce it to the food supply on your own. It turns out documents made public from a lawsuit years later showed it was all fraud, that the scientists were very concerned about the dangers of GMOs. They said it's very different. It leads to different risks, needs to have human toxicological testing and other testing. All that was ignored because of this effort by the White House to promote GMOs. And so they promoted GMOs. It was spearheaded by, it was spearheaded by Michael Taylor. Well, my, my, spearheaded by Monsanto. And, and what happened went was... Back to yeah, Michael Taylor was Monsanto's after. outside attorney, but he had also worked as an attorney for a group of biotech people creating a proposed regulatory framework that would fast track GMOs with essentially no oversight. So when he was put into the role of the deputy commissioner of policy, which was a, poly a role created specifically for him, he would get the recommendations from the scientists and then rewrite it and give it back to them and anger them. You could read the letters, which we have, 
of one scientist says, what's become of this document? It's basically a political, what do I have to do to stay out of trouble document? It doesn't discuss the potential side effects. It's just pro-corporate. So they were angry at the boss, but the boss, Michael Taylor, used to work for Monsanto, got GMOs uh, uh, on the market without any testing or labeling, and then became Monsanto's vice president, and then later became the U.S. food czar under the next administration. So it's a revolving door. And then we end, we end up with um, people like that in the EPA and people like that in the USDA. And so we don't really have a proper regulatory system. We have a captured regulatory system. And who owns it? Well, you can look at the documents made public from the recent lawsuits against Roundup for causing non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in the plaintiffs. And the juries agreed. It turns out they had lapdogs working for them in the EPA, which allowed the approval of Roundup and glyphosate based on rigged research and false science. One of my favorite, I've been documenting the rigged research, what I used to call Monsanto research. And one of my favorites I didn't know about until the, until the lawsuit. I was always the one that was collecting them. There was something entirely new. I was so excited. So when they wanted to prove that the amount of absorption into the human skin was below the required level, they took cadaver skin as they do, and they put Roundup on it, and they found 10% absorbed, which was about 3.3 times the allowable level. So they hid that information illegally, never told the EPA, and instead did Monsanto science. They took skin from a human cadaver, cut it out, and baked it. After they baked it in an oven, they then froze it. Then they applied the Roundup to this leather-like human skin facsimile and very little was absorbed and they reported those numbers to the EPA, never telling them that it was baked and frozen human skin. That's the type of research that Monsanto did in order to get their products approved. I have in my book, Genetic Roulette, I have 41 pages of corporate rigged research, catching them red-handed and willing to risk the lives of humanity. I talked to a former Monsanto scientist. He said when they fed rats, genetically engineered corn, there were serious problems in the health of those rats. And so they rewrote the study to hide the effects. They didn't pull it off the market. They rewrote the study. He wasn't him. It was colleagues he was aware of. Three other of his colleagues tested the milk from cows treated with Monsanto's genetically engineered bovine growth hormone. There was so much cancer-promoting IGF-1 hormone in the milk that the three Monsanto scientists refused to drink milk after that unless it was organic. One bought his own cow. So they know there are problems. And that's why the juries were so angry at Monsanto because there was evidence. I remember debating with a Monsanto toxicologist on the doctor's TV show, and she was all smiles, saying she has complete confidence in this molecule, and she was the chief, the chief uh, investigator. And then when millions of documents were made public from the lawsuit, I did a search on her name, and sure enough, in private, she was linked, concerned about its link to tumors, to animal deaths, to cancer. She ghost wrote a study and removed her name by inserting information reducing its link to miscarriages. So I went back to the doctor's producers and said, see, she wasn't telling the truth. So they had us on again, although no one from Monsanto showed up. And we had a full hour length um, episode just on Roundup and cancer and and the kind of rigged research that we're talking about. So this I is what your, we're facing. I read, that, I read your uh, book where you discussed a couple of things that I would be very interesting to bring up right now. For example, the insulin growth factor one that is produced by cows that are injected with bovine growth hormone, which is GMO, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, the cow's milk has about 10 times the amount of insulin growth factor one in it, and that's been connected to breast and prostate cancer, correct? And, and other cancers as well, exactly. And yeah, then also, and in... go ahead. And then also, the other thing that's startling that I tell people all the time that really rocks them backwards. 
uh, from seeds of deception. There were rats that were in the study. Mm -hmm. They were fed genetically altered and genetically engineered potatoes. And the control rats in the study were given the same parent line of the same potatoes, but not genetically engineered. And the head scientist at the Rowett Institute had been there for 30 years, Arpad Puztai, he was very uh, frightened by the fact that he was finding that, for example, the rats fed the genetically engineered potatoes, the livers, brains, and testicles were smaller than the control rats. And he tried to speak up about this before the study was finished, and he was fired after being there for 30 years, correct? Yeah, it's a, and, and your recalling of it was excellent, Claude. Most interviewers don't have that command of details. Congratulations. And so, yeah, Arpad Pustai, um, he was given about $3 million from the UK government to figure out how to test for the safety of GMOs. And his protocols that he was going to be creating with a team of about 30 were going to be implemented ultimately into the European approval process. He was pro-GMO and didn't expect to be any problem, but he studied in great detail all the things that could go wrong and created a protocol to see if things were going to go wrong. And so, like you said, the rats that were fed his potatoes had smaller brains, livers, and testicles, also partial atrophy of the liver and a damaged immune system, and potentially precancerous cell growth in their digestive tract. Essentially, every system he looked at showed dramatic serious problems. And he went public with his concerns um, with permission from his director when he was invited to be on a TV show in the UK. And they ran a two and a half minute section of the interview. And he was saying that he wouldn't eat it. And he recommended that we don't use our fellow citizens as guinea pigs because he was aware that he had actually read the research that was used to get GMOs approved in the UK and Europe. And he said to me, Jeffrey, you know poor science. You know bad science. And this was really bad. It was so superficial, so flimsy. It, they did everything they could do to get their market, to get their products in the market as soon as possible by doing as little as possible. It wasn't real science. Now, one, his concern was the way he designed his research showed the impact not of the particular t potato that he had genetically engineered with a particular uh, insect or insecticide. It was the generic process of genetic engineering. The same process that's used to create the soy, corn, cotton, canola, sugar beets, alfalfa, etc. The same process that caused those damage to the rats. And so he was aware that the foods that were being served around the world as GMO had never been tested for the things that he tested. It was so superficial, it could be creating those diseases. And so he was strong saying, we shouldn't use our fellow citizens as guinea pigs. And he was the number one scientist to say that because he was actually creating the testing protocols for Europe. And he was a hero at his prestigious institute for about two days. And then two phone calls were allegedly placed from the UK prime minister's office through the receptionist to the director after supposedly Monsanto had called Bill Clinton. Clinton spoke to uh, the <coughs> Prime Minister Blair, and then his office called the director of the Institute, and the next morning Arpad Pustai was fired from his job after 35 years and silenced with threats of a lawsuit. And his data was taken away, he was gagged, he couldn't, he couldn't speak the truth. They put out a big effort to try and hide the truth. This is all written in the first chapter of my book, Seeds of Deception. I spent hours and hours and hours interviewing Arpad Pustai and reading up all the details so that we would have the most accurate and detailed account. And he became the poster child. So no one dared to find problems with GMOs or they would be treated like Arpad Pustai. So the vast majority, more than 99% of all the 
supposed safety studies on GMOs are done by industry where they can choose what they want to release. They can omit certain things and it's terrible research. And there's hardly any independent research now because even in the journal Nature, it says if anyone finds a problem, there's a knee-jerk reaction where they get attacked professionally and even personally by this bullying, systemic bullying built by Monsanto. They actually have budget items to attack scientists. There were letters about me that became public and used in the lawsuit, read to the jury, how I had pointed out that GMOs were more dangerous to children and they decided to go after me and use the word whack-a-mole because every time I spoke, they try and hit me down. So this is the, this is the corporate uh, darkness that we're facing behind some of the foods that we're eating or hopefully not eating by switching to organic. We're speaking with Jeffrey Smith here about genetically engineered food and mic microbes. I interviewed our pod myself about five years or so after your book came out, mm. and he was employed in um, some studies that were being done, I believe, in Sweden. I'm not sure if it's Norway. Sweden or Norway. Norway. Norway, okay. And he told me that his major concern was GMO effects on the immune system that, at that point in his life. That's what he said. Mm. And um, maybe you could go uh, give us an idea of contrast here now the United States and all the other countries that don't label their genetically modified products and Europe can you give us a little contrast of how things are working there in terms of regulation and uh, you're, you're, you're losing the mic okay good uh, yeah so in in Europe it's interesting Europe has a proper labeling almost proper it's it's a pretty good labeling situation where if you have any GMO ingredients um, and it's more than 1%, then the whole thing has to be labeled as GMO. Where it falls short is it doesn't require labeling when it has meat, milk, and eggs from animals that have been fed GMOs. So they can get away with selling um, milk, meat, and eggs from animals that are fed basically 100% GMO and no one knows about it. But because when Arpad Puste went public with his concerns, um, because his, he had a gag order for seven months. The gag order was lifted by an order of parliament, and he was able to speak. Um, uh, there was uh, so over 700 articles written in a single month on GMOs. It became a huge issue in, in the UK and throughout Europe <clears throat> because he was finally able to tell the truth. All the Europeans realized, oh, I don't want to put that in my mouth. And so because it was labeled, and the Europeans said they, didn't, they weren't going to eat it, all the food companies said, okay, we're not going to use GMOs in Europe. The same companies, Nestle's, Unilever, Burger King, McDonald's, they never promised anything to the U.S. because it was never reported there. The whole Arpad Pustai affair was considered one of the 10 most underreported events of the year by Project Censored, a G U.S. media watchdog group. No one knew about it. No one was concerned about it. So the food companies that had committed to the citizens in Europe to remove GMOs were continuing to sell GMOs to unknowing Americans. So that has kept have, GMOs. I have, yeah. I have an interesting little letter here from Kellogg's. Now, they, um, they wrote one letter to the United States, and then they wrote another letter to... Ronnie Cummins, who's the head of the Organic Consumers Association. And they were talking about how in the United States it seems to be accepted anyway at that moment. And, but in Europe, like you just said, here's their sentence. Um, Public acceptance of biotechnology in Europe is lower than in the United States. As a result... All Kellogg products sold in Europe are free of any ingredients derived from biotech sources. So they're treating things differently to please the market. And that was a letter from June 27, 2008. Yeah, that's how it was. And um, I mean, 
I've been watching this for 26 years. It was this big explosion soon after the Arpad Pustai affair. It was Nestle's and Unilever and then virtually everyone all on that side. <laughs> and like there was a kind of a blockage, a blockade about recover, about reporting on GMOs in the United States. Time magazine had their first article on GMOs in Europe and the same issue when it was released in the United States didn't have it. There was there was demonstration of clear bias. And we know sometimes it was overt pressure uh, by advertisers and others uh, on companies in the United States to prevent exposure of this kind of evidence in the United States. And so our Institute for Responsible Technology at responsibletechnology.org, we have been educating through whatever channel we could. So I've spoken in nearly every state in the United States and I had a thousand interviews and trained 1,500 speakers and organized over 10,000 activists in North America and got enough information out so that we actually are now in a tipping point where consumers are saying no to GMOs and the food companies have to remove them in order to maintain market share. But now what's happening in the United States is there's a fake labeling law that was basically designed by Monsanto's minions and their friends at the USDA. So GMOs are not really labeled in the United States. 99% of them, of the products that they have tried, GMOs. They tried to do that. Vermont was going to make it mandatory to be labeled. And I believe it was Mike Pompeo from Kansas when he was the representative who introduced the um, the bills to... Yeah, the, 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 we call it the uh, Dark Act, deny, denying Americans yeah. the right to know. So, um, right. <coughs> yeah, that was a whole a whole interesting piece there. But what, what I was going here, Claude, is that there's this new 2.0 gene editing and the biotech industry has been lying to governments and we know it, they're lying completely. They do this regularly, com telling them that gene editing is predictable and precise and safe and natural. And therefore it doesn't even create GMOs. It shouldn't even be, it shouldn't have anything to do with GMOs when in fact it is a form of creating GMOs and has convinced governments around the world not to regulate products from gene editing. United States, it's happening in Canada, it's happening in the UK, it's already happened in India and Australia and Japan and many South American countries. And there's a lot of pressure on the EU to also deregulate products of gene editing. Now, what that means is when you gene edit, to create a GMO and you don't register it and you don't tell the government, no one will know. It will flood the market, it will infiltrate organic, it'll infiltrate non-GMO, and we will not have the ability to avoid it. But what's worse is, as I said in the beginning, GMO is cheap to create through gene editing. So now, armed with this new CRISPR, many companies, many entrepreneurs, many scientists are targeting virtually anything with DNA to tinker and make changes in order to profit. There could be very well-meaning reasons why they want to eliminate a particular disease that the, that the crop suffers from or whatnot. And there could be like diabolical, horrible ones where they want to genetically engineer out the mothering instinct of livestock so you can separate their, their children at birth and not have them freak out. But, and these, these are actually, uh, have been considered. So with gene editing, we are con we're looking at the possibility of this generation replacing nature so future generations will not inherit the products of the billions of years of evolution, but instead inherit products created from a technique whose number one most common result is surprise side effects. So we have released a, a six-minute animated video on... What actually happens in the DNA when you gene edit? And I can just quote the journal Nature, which is one of the most prestigious biological journals. They called it chromosomal mayhem. Chromosomal mayhem was the result of what happened when you used CRISPR on th in three different studies. This happened to be on human uh, embryo cells. And they're using that same technique on our food supply without any requirements for anyone from the government to know about it. Now, over time, 
This means that insects and grass and trees and fish and birds can become gene edited and have different traits than were originally created, which could be a disaster. But, and here's where we get to the microbial part. What are the most dangerous kingdoms to genetically engineer? I've given you the answer. Microbes. We didn't need a pandemic to know that microbes can travel, mutate, swap genes with other microbes, end up in new ecosystems around the world very, very quickly. So when you gene edit bacteria or viruses or algae or the fungi that forms the, the network under the trees and under all that, when you make changes in there, you're changing a fundamental aspect of biology that is essential for health, human and otherwise, and not well understood, and it operates holistically. So a slight change here could end up interfering with a whole ecosystem on the other side of the planet. We're speaking with Jeffrey Smith today. And uh, Jeffrey, can you um, talk a little bit about the fact that when two bacteria get together, they can exchange their genes? Yes. So my friend, Dr. Michelle Perro calls this bacterial sex. <clears throat> so let's say you were to create um, bacteria that's designed to help the soil in Arkansas. Then that bacteria, the bacteria travel through many ways, <clears throat> and they meet other bacteria, and they have sex. Now, the changes that you made that were designed for this one ecosystem and this one organism are now affecting the way this other organism is working in its ecosystem. And then it starts to travel and mutate. So now you have maybe a hundred different types of organisms traveling and mutating and swapping genes when you started out with one. And then they swap genes with others and they swap genes with others. And all of a sudden you now have a vast network of possible changes. Some of those may end up in our gut or on our skin or in our eyes or in our brains because the microbiome, which is the community of microbes, is part of us. We have more microbial cells than we have our cells in our own body, 10 times. But it's not just by numbers. We actually co-evolved with our microbiome and we outsource about 90% of our metabolic and chemical functions according to human microbiome expert, Kiran Krishnan. And he points out that about 80% of human diseases have their source in imbalance of the microbiome. It's like there's programming in the microbes, so much so that you can take actual fecal matter from someone who's sick and put it in someone who's healthy and that person will get sick, but the opposite can occur. You can put healthy fecal matter into a sick person and they can get healthy, but you can also transfer tendencies and moods and whether they gain weight or lose weight. The programming is so vast and it's so important. The microbes help protect our health and the establishment of a healthy microbe in an infant can set better health for the rest of their lives and future generations. So much so that as part of this evolution, milk digesting bacteria move into the birth canal during the second trimester to inoculate the baby. A large percentage of the breast milk is not designed to feed the baby. It's indigestible by the baby. It's designed to feed the microbes. The health of the microbiome of the baby is reflected in their salivary microbes, which then go back through the breastfeeding to the mother, which can change the formula. So much attention on the microbes. Scientists are in awe. There's over 50,000 studies now in the last six years, and they're in awe of the role of the microbiome for human health. We know very little about the vastness of it. We've only characterized a small percentage. And yet, we are going to equip high school classes all over the United States and Europe and eventually around the world with CRISPR kits and microbes where you can mail order different sequences and mail order different microbes and create new combinations that'll end up released into the environment. Many will die, will not survive, but those that survive may have a survival advantage and then end up perhaps making it impossible to breastfeed, making it impossible for the soil 
to capture carbon, making it impossible for so many other aspects of life that we don't even know are related to a healthy microbiome. So we've been at the Institute for Responsible Technology, IRT, we've pivoted. We were focused a lot on GMOs and their problems with food, including Roundup. And we pioneered the messaging, which started the tipping point. But then GMO 2.0 comes on along and we realize we need to protect against the new gene editing. And even within that, the most serious threat is the microbiome. Because if we don't stop it, and we, well, there's a film which, this, which you've seen, Don't Let the Gene Out of the Bottle, just 16 minutes. You can see it at protectnaturenow.com, part of our nonprofit page. Don't Let the Gene Out of the Bottle at protectnaturenow.com. In those 16 minutes, you're introduced to a near cataclysm that occurred from a genetically engineered microbe designed by well-meaning scientists to help farmers that could have ended terrestrial plant life if a certain condition, number of conditions were made. Another microbe, well-meaning to protect against early frost, could have changed weather patterns on the planet. We know these things because they are theoretically possible and we don't want to release them to find out if they're actually possible. And every time you release a microbe, you increase the risk. Multiply that by all the students in high school science classes and by in college classes, home hobbyists, and then all of the entrepreneurs and large corporations like Monsanto. And you're in a situation where you are betting the farm in the biggest way. You are betting and gambling with the health of this and all future generations. And it can happen quickly. So we are, we are raising money through our nonprofit. We are building a new global movement to stop the release of genetically engineered microbes immediately and to make that a requirement in schools to teach it so that all future generations understand that with this new technology and ability comes a new responsibility. We're speaking to Jeffrey Smith, and Jeffrey, the uh, that 16-minute video that you uh, mentioned that is available for anybody to watch for free. The um, and the you mentioned uh, in past uh, communications that I've watched with you that the other thing about the high school CRISPR mm -hmm. is sometimes what they do is they just flush the result uh, after the class down the t down the drain, and yes. it gets into the water. I mean, put it this way, if, if you don't think there's any problem with gene, gene editing bacteria, it'll be on your fingers, it'll be on your clothes, it'll be airborne, it'll be in your mouth, you'll drink it, you can flush it down the toilet. And we're talking about, these are outdoor re environmental releases. You know, even in very, very highly secure laboratories that deal with pathogens. There's been over a thousand accidents recorded and reported by USA Today in a series and many, many, many more that were unreported. In even the most respected labs like the uh, CDC or NIH labs, you know, anthrax lab, the, in, the influenza lab, dealing with the most dangerous ones, there were accidents and releases. So now we're giving, you don't hand out a detonator to atomic bombs, or, you know, pass it out in a classroom, say, see this red button? This is what would happen if you push the red button. No one is that stupid. But no one has put together the fact that when you start handing out CRISPR combinations to change the microbiome, one of those may be a detonator. And we've seen it with invasive species. In 1859, they released 24 rabbits in Australia so that the visitors from the UK could feel more at home to hunt the rabbits. Well, rabbits multiply like rabbits, and they didn't have the natural predators. And by the 1920s, there was over 10 billion rabbits, completely changing the ecosystem. And now we have a situation where that's nothing compared to the amount of microbes that can be created in short order, and it won't stop in one continent. So... We have, we have an urgent situation 
given that very few people are even thinking about this? Well, let's think about it. We're speaking with Jeffrey Smith here about genetically engineering foods and microbes. The patenting of these new genes and these new seeds, etc., is where the money is being made, and mm -hmm. that's one of the goals. And one of our most foremost uh, uh, popular figures in the world, Bill Gates, is involved with patenting these seeds. And he is now, I don't know if everybody knows this, but he is now the number one farmland owner in the United States of America. Can you talk a little bit about how you patent, how do they patent these seeds? And it was interesting. <clears throat> there was originally a sense that you had to create something new and invent something and it couldn't be biological. But the Supreme Court changed that in the 70s <clears throat> and allowed you to patent life forms where you've changed the genes. One major follow-up um, test case before the Supreme Court also went in Monsanto's favor. And the uh, majority opinion was written by a former Monsanto at attorney, Clarence Thomas. Um, but now, in many parts of the world, you can patent genes. And some of the genes that are inside us uh, are actually patented. <clears throat> and even though they haven't been changed at all, they've been discovered. So there's, there's a, genes associated with breast cancer, and there was research going on with those genes. And the company that owned the patents sent notes to all of these laboratories saying, if you want to do this research, you have to pay us a lot of money. And it stopped a lot of the research on cancer. So there's been a long effort to try and stop the patenting of life. Um, it hasn't been successful. Um, there's been some success, as my friend Vandana Shiva was able to stop the patenting of chapati flour from India and turmeric or neem, things like that. But in general, a lot of the reasons why these companies genetically engineer is because then they can patent. One of the popular um, types of corn that's genetically engineered in millions of acres, it kills the European corn borer. Well, there's a natural corn that does that, but that's not patentable. So they'll risk the health of the whole population by genetic engineering with an accident-prone technology because they can patent it. And they do it in okay, a way- Okay, Jeffrey, well, you got about 10 seconds left. Of, so thank you so much for coming in I, I know we could go on and on and on. There's so much more information, and you're great, and thank you so much for coming on today. Thank you so much, Claude. I appreciate it.